Welcome to the Fact Dev Lounge podcast, the faculty development podcast for Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick. And today we're going to be talking to Dr. Paul Atkinson, who's the new assistant dean of Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick Research. He also happens to be the clinical academic head of emergency medicine here in St. John. And we're so glad to be talking today about research and all the opportunities and why research is fun and maybe even sexy. Join us now with our conversation with Dr. Paul Atkinson. Welcome to the Fact Dev Lounge podcast, your faculty development podcast for Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick. I'm Dr. Sarah Gander, a general pediatrician and your host for this podcast. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Paul Atkinson, our new clinical academic department head of emergency medicine and the new assistant dean of research for Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick. And he's going to talk to us today about why we should all be involved in research or the title that I prefer, why research is sexy. Welcome, Paul. Hey, Sarah. How are you? Uh, Great. Thanks for how the are intro. You? And um, <laughs> kind of strange to be talking about research being sexy. But anyway, there you go. Why not? Well, there's all of these, you know, courses and chatter about knowledge translation. That's the big, mm. that's the big term du jour about all of this little closet research many of us have been doing for years, um, but how to really bring it to the forefront and really show it off. So, listen, I agree with you a hundred percent. I think um, both you and I have, in fact, engaged in this open access approach to to research. I, I know that for sure. With curious. C-U-R-E-U-S, um, in case anyone's interested in looking it up. And we, we both have channels. And uh, it's kind of exciting to be able to really promote some local research, really right out there internationally, whoever wants to access this without a firewall, without without payment. So I think that's that's possibly the future. But hey, I know we're getting ahead of ourselves. That's the end, the end point when we publish. So there's, you know, you're right. There's clearly a, a long journey getting from an idea, a question, a why should we do something different, right through to actually achieving that change in clinical care. I've heard it estimated to be up to 15 years. So you're right, knowledge translation is, you know, that end part, very exciting. And I'm glad that we've really started to to engage there and, and improve that. I do think we still have a long way to go, in fact, in engaging clinicians in the earlier parts as well, even if it's just question generation or contributing to, you know, research project development. I think there's lots that, that faculty here at DMNB and, and Dal across the Maritimes could could really get engaged in and become part of. And hopefully that's something that, that we can chat about as we move forward. Why do you think that research is so important for faculty to think about? We got enough on our plates, Paul. Yeah, I know. Uh, that, that's a fair point. We do have enough on our plates. And hey, if somebody comes along and says, why don't you take on this extra workload for no pay? Well, that's very enticing, isn't it? It, it would need to be, need to be <laughs> extremely sexy for someone to want to do that for, for nothing. So you could give yourself a 100% raise every I year. I know, I know, and more. But, but listen, no, you're right. Why would we take this on? Well, I think it's part of creating a culture of improvement here in New Brunswick within medicine. You know, we're not Harvard, we're not Cambridge, Oxford, wherever, but neither should we be behind the times. We need to be engaged with larger centers, networked in, so that we are learning about new ways to improve patient care, whether that's at a population level, whether that's in a laboratory sense, or whether it's a therapeutic. We need to be aware of these. We need to be thinking about doing things better. That's what really motivates me, to be to be honest. It's, um, it's, I've always found it a challenge when you, when you see the care that people are receiving not be perhaps state-of-the-art, perhaps personally having traveled around a little bit, and certainly many of our faculty have traveled around. You sometimes have the question, well, why can't we do that? And so I think part of building that culture of, of excellence has to include research. Because research is essentially just challenging what we do now. It's really no more than that. It's just a matter of coming up with good questions as to how we can do things better or what the gold standard should be and testing it, testing to see if it works, not just in general, but in fact, in the environment that you want to practice it in. 
So I think that's why it's important. It's by itself, you know, this idea of, oh, we have to have a research program and we have to get funding and, you know, we get grant applications and success and we can publish that. Well, that's great. But to be honest, to me, that's not an output. That's really just part of the process. The output for me, as you started off this conversation, is actually seeing it put into practice. I think that a lot of the listeners would, because their faculty agree that one of the benefits of having students work with us is that is that they make us challenge the status quo. They hopefully come at it with the question that is curious, which is, you know, why do we do it that way? And I think if anything in the in the world over the past year or so, we've really questioned, well, why do we do it that way? And COVID-19, if nothing, has pushed us out of our comfort zone to do business differently. And what a wonderful opportunity then to have research be part of that picture. I think that people think of research as always being, you know, kind of the bench research or somebody kind of sitting in an office, like, you know, crunching numbers on SPSS or something. But there's a whole world out there, I should say, of research that is different than that. You mentioned quality improvement research. Um, Mm -hmm. but would you agree that there's lots of other kind of neat ways that people can engage in some scholarship? Well, that's a tough one. Yeah, of course I agree. That is, that is like the easiest, (laughs) the easiest question to be asked. Um, however, I want to be careful not to in any way disrespect or fail to appreciate the amazing groundwork that, uh, that is provided by full-time researchers, scientists, the, the team we have at DMNB, the, the PIs, the principal investigators there, are a hard-working, committed bunch of people who have really created a research environment here. But I would agree with you that perhaps sometimes it's a little dislocated from the other side of the parking lot where you have the clinicians and um, administrators and perhaps even the public, in fact, definitely the public at times, who will, will you know, as you say, will not see the output from that. So I think engaging in bigger questions, questions that can be answered with novel methodologies, new ways of doing things. So I I was never really a fan of qualitative research until I tried it and then suddenly realized this is very powerful. You can actually in a very quick time with a small number of people really get to the center, the essence of what the problem might be and even to what potential solutions might be. Another example would be the type of work that you're doing where you sort of integrate research in a, in a quality improvement cycle, looking at <clears throat> perhaps an area that's locally important, but also relevant outside the local area because you know we're not that dissimilar to other places across the world. And so setting up programs that engage not just the clinical side, but the quality side, um, and, and then having research questions answered as part of that. And I think we have often created false silos and false barriers between different types of investigative work. Like, for instance, even the fact that we make a big deal about something being quality improvement versus true research. To me, it's a gray area that, that they kind of merge into each other. I mean, clearly the purists will say research is defining new standards and quality improvement is closing the gap between where you are now and, and that defined standard. But I think there are many other questions that can be answered along the way with the data that you collect that, that will help you move beyond where you even felt you were going in the first place. So absolutely. Now, in terms of how, We do that. How do we get people to see research as more than just somebody in a in a white coat in a lab chasing mice? It's very tricky, but I do think we we have to start having conversations and getting together. And I think you're right, COVID has as this podcast is just showing, has enabled us all to communicate much more easily without um, polluting the environment in our in our gasoline-fueled monster vehicles as we drive around from meeting to meeting, we can simply sit here and um, allow Silicon Valley to do that pollution for us. But, you know, you know, we, we, we are connected and we can get large groups of people together and, and, we can, and we can connect and really hear what people need. I think there are ways to, I mean, there's money out there to support this. It's just that it's not super accessible. And I think there are ways that we can really help people find that. 
And there are ways to convince leadership, to convince government that it's worth investing in research and quality improvement. So if I'm permitted a quick example, and no names will be mentioned, but when I pushed initially in this job for a recognition that clinicians should have some protected time for research, one of the provisos that I was given was, well, as long as it doesn't impact their clinical work. And so my <laughs> my answer immediately was, well, it will. It'll make it in a positive it'll way. make it better. Um, it has to make it better. If you're stopping and taking time to think, to read the literature, to to become up to date in a certain area, to develop expertise, to mentor students and residents, to publish to go through that publication cycle of having things pushed back at you so that you improve the way you think how can that not improve care in new brunswick and in the maritimes you know I, so I, I think we really need to persuade our leaders at government and senior health authority leaders to really see the value of this now the flip side is you can't just throw money away. You can't just say, hey, take the money and do what you want. I think it does have to be targeted to to the needs of what our community um, is facing right now. And so that's one of the things we've, we've created a, a research council that I know <clears throat> I'm hoping you will come along and contribute to because you've so much spare time. But I, I do think that it's a valuable hour and a half every couple of months where we're trying to bring together researchers under four pillars and so the base pillar really is that that laboratory and basic scientist research alongside health services research so our epidemiologists our occupational medicine researchers people like yourself who are interested in um, social questions and others um, dr jarrett who's interested in, in in age care elderly care so that sort of basic science health services and then the other two pillars of our of our new council building really are um, are clinical so to support clinicians in helping face the challenges of, of getting clinical research done and then educational research so we have a rim a rim project here that sorry a rim program a rim program that is excellent um, it is really engaged many across our faculty here at Dow with projects and research that people who perhaps wouldn't have before because now they have the resource and the partnership of the university through the medical students and their time. So I think building that, it's not formally part of the research um, program at Dal, but we partner with RIM. And so just asking questions about how do we best do that? How do we engage students? In research that's meaningful you know that in itself is a is a real pillar of research so there you go so those are the four things and so I think we're trying to spread it we're trying to make it more accessible we're trying to build it beyond that traditional laboratory approach even here in New Brunswick Right. Well, I had the benefit of um, having several RIM research and medicine students over the past couple of years and I agree it's really probably allowed me to leverage a lot of my research with collaborating with the students who bring a certain energy and eye to things, but also are able to help you complete projects and keep you on deadlines yes. and things of that nature. So that's lovely. There's been lovely support through Dow. I wonder if you could speak to, and I know you're new in this position as the assistant dean, and we'll link the website to the research piece for Dalhousie in the show notes, but can you speak at all to the team that we have here at DMMB? Because I think sometimes they're sort of the unsung hidden heroes of research at Dalhousie and would love to love to just kind of give them a shout out. For sure. Um, well, we have we're a pretty small but powerful team here at DMMB. And so, as I mentioned, the, the, the really is a, a foundation of, of basic scientists <clears throat> who work here in, in the department, or sorry, in, in the building, within their own departments as well. So we have um, Dr. Brunt, Keith Brunt, um, who's in the Department of Pharmacology. Um, and we have Petra in the Department of Biochemistry and Thomas in the Department of Biochemistry. And they are sort of our three uh, basic scientists who work in the labs, along with Tony Ryman, the previous um assistant dean for research who also utilizes that lab space but is technically linked to UNB because we partner here we're not 
you know, we like to break down silos. And so Tony is a, a UNB researcher based at DMNB. As well as that, then we have uh, Dan, Dan Dutton, who's in the Department of Community Health and Epidemiology. And he is really heading up the, the health services pillar. Um, we have the vacant seat or chair, I beg your pardon, the chair of occupational medicine. And so we're, we'll, we'll be excited, hopefully, to fill that very soon. And then we have, you know, those are the, the researchers who are on salary, the core PIs here, um, along with myself as the assistant dean. Then we have our chief operating officer, Pam Bork, who supports the team. And we have um, uh, Nikki and Laurie, who are our administrative assistants there. But more importantly, in, in terms of resources, we are a conduit for people in New Brunswick to the larger set of, of resources that Dalhousie Faculty of Medicine provides. And so as you, you mentioned the website, so we're building that, it's, it's still a work in progress, but for instance, we would encourage people to go to the website, just go to the DMMB website and go click on research. And at the bottom right-hand corner, you'll be able to register yourself as a Faculty of Medicine a researcher or someone who's interested in research, even if you're supervising a, a REM student or if you are applying for a grant, whatever it is, register yourself so that we know that you're here. We know that we can invite you to things. We can distribute uh, resources to you if we're circulating them on our email list. It's a very quick, easy form. It takes about one minute to fill out. And so we, we really do encourage all faculty here in New Brunswick to register because if you're a DAL faculty member, then you're part of our family. You're part of our our research team. Now that we do also list on the website other resources that I mentioned at DAL. So it'll take you through to the main Faculty of Medicine page. And there I think there's really some interesting stuff. So there's a peer review program, people who will help you if you have a grant application, they'll they'll help review that. There are bridge funding programs, there are mentor mentorship programs, project management services. There's um, more information about the RIM um, program and then some really interesting things about the clinical investigator program and the graduate medical research programs, things that I had never really heard about even just a year ago, even though I've been a researcher in New Brunswick for 10 years. These are opportunities for new faculty and for residents to, to essentially achieve a degree, a higher degree um, through research as they work. So it's kind of like this, I can do this on the side, I can take some time out, I can find some time. And it's supported by, by DAL. So yes, there'll be a little bit of paperwork to get agreement from your program um, head uh, to approve this, but it is all legitimate and gives you that sort of protected time to improve your, your research portfolio and knowledge. So that's just a few of the examples that are right there um, available but perhaps underused um, at the moment, yeah. right? I think too, um, sometimes people feel like you have to be near the campus to really avail of a lot of these things. But again, if the virtual world has taught us anything, it's that, you know, collaboration can happen across the internet and that many of our folks who maybe live in more rural areas or want to collaborate from other areas could could do so regardless of not being here, maybe in St. John. Oh, for sure. Uh, you know, I, I think that's more true now than ever. So yeah, you know, if you're wherever you are, there's, there's no reason that you couldn't become involved. Um, so for instance, um, one of the, there's a group, there's a team called Impart and then they're a network that's somewhat um, based here at DMNB, uh, Keith Brunt and Petra and others have been, and uh, Ansar Hassan from the hospital are, are key members of this, along with many others. But they have connections right across the country, across the Maritimes, and there are projects that come from that team that, yeah, and sometimes the authors have never set foot in St. John or New Brunswick at all, and yet there they are, part of a, a network and a team. And I'll mention our own, we have the shock research network that, um, I don't know how many papers we have out now, probably six or seven papers that relate to um, echocardiography in, in hypotension and, and in cardiac arrest. And that network 
um, really again spans the globe and yet it's based here in St. John in New Brunswick. So absolutely, you don't have to be, you know, local to be involved in, in, the, in the research that's ongoing. Um, in fact, what I would mention as well, I think it's really important is that I, I touched briefly and mentioned mentorship. So without completely overwhelming our team here, there are of course opportunities for partnership when if somebody comes along with a really great idea, they're prepared to put some work in to get started on that sort of ladder of, of research. You know, we can partner up with some established researchers who can help that person um, as part of the team in their research project and lead them to success. And I think that model, as you asked earlier, how do you get into this? Well, don't try it by yourself. If there's any advice I'm going to really give is isolated research is prone to failure. And I would challenge people to say, show me a really big impactful paper out there that has one author. You know, it, it doesn't really exist. So, you know, you got, it's a team, it's a team sport. Is this another village scenario? Is of course it? it is. There you go. <laughs> of course it is. Yeah. Would you, you know, Paul, it's funny because sometimes I think people think research is kind of the, um, I don't know, kind of this, the slower part of things. It does take a long time. Uh-huh to get that knowledge translated. You mentioned some of the open access availabilities, which really offers that sort of real time or just in time learning where we can really just, you know, make big impacts in short periods of time. Would you say, cause I would, so not to bias you, that that's almost the most fun part. Like, what do you think the most fun part is? Is that proper English? Most fun part is for you for um, research. What's the funniest part? Um, No, the most fun. fun. Like, you know, you have the question. For me, it's like you have the question, you, the design and kind of like slogging through some of the data collection and stuff can be, can have its challenges, but there's nothing better than having the question and then looking at the answer and being like, I can deliver this to somebody and it might impact change. I think that is a cool part. I really do. I enjoy that. I think the, I'll be honest, the most fun or funnest, not funniest, but funnest part is really when you see someone in your team who's perhaps a medical student or a resident who came along because they had to do a project, get engaged and suddenly really want to do things and start to drive you forward and start to push things. And then when you see them maybe present at a national conference or a local conference or just just to the local group and you see how they've really gotten into their topic they've become an expert in something they've answered a question and there they are making medicine a little bit better one piece at a time and you know you can see how proud they are and so you take pride in them for their achievement to me that's the best but I have to be honest, sure, it's always nice when you get another paper or publication. It's even nice if somebody gives you a prize. But honestly, I think seeing other people succeed, and I know that sounds a bit, I don't know, but it, it, it truly is genuine. That, that for me is the fun part, just seeing somebody then think, wow, this is pretty cool. And, um, and maybe spurring them on to, to encourage others to, to get into the game and, and take on. You're right. Cause the, the research in medicine program, I mean, not to give it a shameless plug again, cause obviously I don't get any research in medicine. There's no proceeds. <laughs> I remember, so my first research in medicine student, I was shout out to Alex Saunders is I remember she, we, we uh, ambitiously set up this prospective situation where she was collecting data over summer and she really needed to get 200 of these mm-hmm data collection things done, which meant having patients volunteer, which you can imagine how hard it is to get. It was, it, it was parents of children who had a diagnosis of autism to volunteer yes. and she had to get to 200 mm. and she needed a control group, which was another 200. And she, you know, I remember the day when she came into my office and she was like, I have an, I have 186. And I said, well, do you want me to run the numbers again and see if that was enough? And she was like, Dr. Gander, I told you I'd get 200. 
I will get 200. <laughs> and she like walked into my office again. And when she came back with like the 200 and we could run the, run the tests with the power that we needed. And, and she was so proud and it was a great paper. It was a great, it was a great project and it's really, and it spurred on a follow-up project that had funding and and so I was just so proud of her and proud of us for, for going the distance with it that, you know, you're right. That's a pride and like just such yeah. a lovely, a lovely that's thing. That's awesome. That's a great story. And, but it's interesting because you mentioned statistics, you said the word power. And so, Hey, um, just the way to, to keep everyone on the podcast is of course, to get into statistics and, um, <laughs> you know, listen, if you want to ask. But no, like part two will be all about T tests and like ANOVAs and everybody will be like, oh my gosh. I know, I know. But, Don't but bother. Listen, but being serious, one of the, the other fun bits, I think, is challenging the nerdiness of research and not so much the nerdiness because it is a bit nerdy, but perhaps the elitism. I challenge the elitism because I think it gets thrown at me sometimes. It gets thrown at, well, you know, I have to do... I have to sh do shifts and night shifts and work weekends and you just look at numbers and publish them and you know it's just not the same we're not the same and so i have over the years and perhaps it's because i'm came from ireland and then moved to england i you know any irishman who goes to cambridge is always a bit of a rebel because you're considered to be one and so i just i guess i i, I kept that 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 coat on and I kind of pushed back a little bit and, and I know you're never going to completely change how we do research, but in terms of the accessibility, the, in terms of making it more relevant to people and challenging stuff like arbitrary statistical cutoffs. So one of my bugbears is this, anybody who writes that we found something that was statistically significant in a paper, I immediately strike that out because what does that matter? What's important is, was it different? Was there an improvement? And how do we measure that improvement? Well, it depends what you're looking at. So because somebody set some arbitrary 0 0.05 for a p-value, I mean, come on, really? I mean, who, who, get to, who gets to say that? So a 1 in 20 chance, that's okay, but maybe a 1 in 19 isn't. You know, so these arbitrary, I'm, I'm not a fan of binary things. I know in New Brunswick, we like to divide things up if we can. You know, we can go French, English, North, South, Moncton, St. John. We like, we like our, our divides, right? But the reality is that there are things in between. You know, people in Sussex are real. And, you know, so, and people who are bilingual, that's, that's awesome. And you know what? People who actually speak Arabic and people from... Our, our First Nations communities who speak other languages are also real. And so this idea that you just create binaries, bigger, smaller, significant, non-significant, I don't like it. I'm definitely much more of a Bayesian thinker about, well, what's the probability? What's the chance? Has it moved it to a more likely? Has it moved it to a less likely? I think people can accept, accept that better than some complex statistical test. They have no clue how it was done and you're at, they're asked to believe it because you condense it all down into one number that's made up anyway. So there you go. There's my little rant about statistics. I, I'm not... God, I love it. I mean, I think the people who have been hating on mm -hmm. like p-values are just kind of, you know, just have their hands sort of in the yeah. air, um, you know, screaming Yahoo because it's, it's no wonder that you have an appreciation for qualitative research more now, if that's your view. I mean, what better than to tell people's stories? Yeah. And it's not that there isn't a place for... In my for, opinion, that's a lot of the work that sure. I do. No, I get that. And, and I'm not completely dissing statistics. You, you, you need to know if something is real, especially if you are treating someone and giving them a, a medication. So you do need to know risk. You, you, I mean, that's important. It's really important. But... But the arbitrariness of just of, of, of something being either side of a, of a cutoff, that that doesn't turn me on at all. You know, what, what matters to me is things like effect size. So and um, this, you know, the spread of some sort of population statistics. So, you know, how how accurate is something and how how focused is your effect? I mean, you know, there is no Mr. Average. That's what I or Miss Average. I, I, I've yet to meet them. I mean, there's one person out there in Canada who's right in the middle and who's average. So 
why do we base all our statistics around that one person in, in a population and somebody else when in fact you've got this skew either side of uh, that just gets kind of ignored at times so you know maybe maybe it speaks my language because nobody does that kind of research you know like kids kids pregnant moms you know underrepresented in the research world obviously a lot of our work is extrapolated from you know average white Canadian male mm -hmm. sort of studies. Mm -hmm. And um, so like there must be, you know, hopefully we're planting seeds for people who in their own unique practices dealing with individuals could either say, you know, as faculty, I'm curious about this scenario. Mm -hmm. And, or in medical education, to your point earlier about medical education research, you know, I'm curious if this would, be better or make a difference or, you know, is different than. Um, so when you start with that moment of curiosity, because that's how I teach the students to view research is, is you go through your day. The best kind of research for, for me is I go through my day and I say, I wonder. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I start to build on that. What would you say to the faculty here? Like, so you're, you're wondering, you're curious. Mm -hmm. What's the next step? I think the next step is to try to to frame your question, and I don't want to get too technical here, but 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 yeah, actually frame it in in something that's a little bit structured. So I know people use the PICO format. I know people use the PEO format, but something where you're saying, well, what who am I interested in, and what am I interested in in that population, and what outcome do I care about? So you know the people the intervention, if you want to call it that, or the thing I want to do and the outcome I'm interested in. And then I guess the other thing to do is have a kind of a little matrix in your head and, and try to put down some priorities and say, well, is this important? Does it really matter? Or is it just sort of some something in my head that I'm interested in? So how you do that could become more complex thinking about how common it is or if there's a significant mortality or morbidity associated with it, if it has long-term impact on society, you know, you got to think, what's the importance of my question? And then on the other axis, I think you got to think, is it feasible? Is it feasible for me to, to get involved in trying to answer this, right? So some things just can't be answered in the situation you're in. It needs a multi-center RCT involving complex facilities that we just don't have whereas some things can some things right in front of you so I, I think yeah so structure your question and then just do that quick matrix of is it important and is it feasible and you know what if it comes out that it's important and it's feasible well you're, you're off to the races and then you can really start to sit down and think well how am I going to do this who do I need to contact have a quick look around we're trying to set up bit of a database even on our own on, in, at, at DMNB about people and their interests and um, you know so who would be interested in this who has done something similar before um, which pillar might it fall under maybe somebody else at UNB or Horizons interested in this and we can create a little team and start to explore if it's if it's doable um, you know put it out there for a RIM student if it's something simple perhaps think about a resident if you're in in a center that has residents, um, you know, and then of course there comes the whole funding part. So how do I pay for this? And that's the hardest bit because speaking to faculty out there, we all kind of get paid one way or another for our clinical work, right? I mean, clearly pediatricians being at the top of that clinical payment structure, looking down on everyone else. <laughs> Um, would... okay. All right. You just lost all your credibility with me, Paul. It's all oh, over. We're not friends oh, anymore. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I, well, the, the, you know, the payment per kilogram is really high for pediatricians. It's just, I'll give okay, you that. Thank you. Um, anyway. Our own kilos or our, pa oh, our patients. patients kilos. Yeah, there okay, you go. Perfect. So anyway, the, the, the payment structures there, we all get paid something for clinical and you know, there's some payment structure there for teaching for sure. Right. You can, you can pick up a, a a module you can you can teach online you can go do cbl clinical skills all of that you might not become a millionaire but you you get something for it but then it comes to research and it's like go find your own money there's none there well that's a challenge and i think that's something we need to address we need to, there are actually ways to get some money there are 
There's the Chesley uh, Family Foundation Fund that can be applied for. Go again to the website. It's not a lot of money, but it's enough to really help you get going. Um, there are there are scholarships out there through the NBHRF, clinical scholarships that are awarded for four years at a time, which will give you, you know, perhaps a 0.1 or 0.2 FTE time. There's money through foundations, through Dalhousie Medicine Research Foundation, through other hospital foundations will sometimes support research. Of course, there's other granting agencies that, that become a sort of a higher level application you, when you start looking for MBHRF or the Innovation um, Fund or CIHR, all of these things start to involve quite a lot of work. But with the right team and with uh, the office at Horizon Health, the research services office there, which are just really helpful, and the DAL office and maybe some people at UNB and partnering, you know, it's possible that, that funding can come together, but it isn't easy. And I've kind of had this approach over the years that I've been criticized for, which was to not spend all my time trying to win grants. Because I, I thought, well, look, I only have a certain amount of hours to spend on research every week. I can put a large chunk of that into trying to find money, or I can put the time into doing the research. And so I went for the latter. I said, yes, we'll do some searches to keep research coordinator, the wonderful Jackie Fraser in emergency medicine and a few small grants for our, our faculty, our staff at the hospital, uh, physicians to engage. But most of the time is going to be spent doing the research, teaming up, creating networks, coming up with questions, trying to answer them. And I think that plays out pretty well in a smaller center for clinicians. Um, it'll never be your main gig, but you can get some success that way. So whatever time you can find, just spend it on the research, but partner with people who have the skill set. Don't try it yourself. Find somebody else who can write a CIHR grant for you and let them do that. I think, I think, I think I'm coherent in what I'm saying. So it's like, don't get carried away with chasing money. Try to get some research done, but don't forget about it either. And, and reach out to people here at, at Horizon or at Dal who can, who can maybe help you. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. Well, would you have any kind of um, end of the podcast words for some of the other faculty in New Brunswick who may... Uh, be in different parts, like I think about kind of the crew up in the Miramichi or even collaborations with um, Vitalite and Sherbrooke and and what some opportunities might be there for some of our New Brunswick faculty. So first you're saying you've had enough and we're done, but that's okay. Um, we, I'll, 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 I'll chip in that. Yeah, so so you're absolutely right. The, the, the challenges are perhaps a little different if you are in rural New Brunswick. However, I think there are programs out there. So for instance, the New Brunswick Trauma Program, believe it or not, has a research subcommittee that in, that crosses those boundaries and, and, and has people from Vitalite, from the Ambulance Service of New Brunswick, um, from Horizon, from the universities, and it's provincial. And, you know, and, and with actual staff in, in smaller centers around. Of course, we have Dalhousie Medicine New Brunswick has our longitudinal programs, both at undergraduate and then the Faculty of Medicine at postgraduate level with family medicine and uh, emergency medicine programs where, where, where students and residents rotate around the province. And I think engaging with those programs so that you can um, perhaps be a mentor for a RIM student or a resident when they come to your site in Upper River Valley or Miramichi, I think that's a great way to get into this. Um, We've had a couple of projects in emergency medicine um, with um, with other hospitals. So Dr. Chandra Kavish, who's now our new um, research director for emergency medicine. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Doesn't time fly? Can we just have a moment of silence for I remember him getting into medical school and how old that means. I know. We, we are. are. Okay. Big shout out to Kavish. Right. You're right. This is a, a you know, he's amazing. It, it's, it's true. He is a product of of New Brunswick, really. Mount Allison, you know, I mean, he's from BC, clearly. Um, you know, he's got that West Coast vibe, but he he's so cool. And he's you know, Mount Allison, then Dal, DMNB, uh, residency program here in New Brunswick through Family Medicine, Emergency Medicine, and now 
faculty and research director. So that's a success story of local mentorship and really commitment and, and on his part. But anyway, his, he's done projects with the team up in Upper River Valley looking, it was kind of like a, I suppose it was really a, a quality improvement type study, a choosing wisely study. Um, and, and, and that was done between two hospitals, between St. John and Upper River Valley with great success and presented nationally and published. So yeah, I think teaming up with one of the, I won't call them large centers because I don't think we have any large research institutes here in healthcare in New Brunswick, but certainly larger centers in Moncton, St. John. I think that's the way to start um, and, and then grow your program beyond that locally. Amazing. When you think about your research career so far, what was the, what was the study that really made the most difference to you personally that you really felt was a success story for you? Ooh, that's tough. I mean, there's there's a couple. I know you want one, but for me personally, the challenge. The research challenge, which I don't think is what you're asking about, but I just want to touch on, was when we did our shocked study, as it was called, the sonography in hypotension and cardiac arrest in the emergency department study, which was a six-center RCT um, involving North America and Africa. And, you know, so it was a, a full-on RCT, got published in Annals of Emergency Medicine, the big team and created essentially the network that then spun off many other opportunities and projects. For me, that was like six to eight years work that started, that started when a medical student in the, I think he was in the first class or maybe the second class at DMNB. I'll give him a shout out, James Milne. And James came up to me, <laughs> good St. John boy. And he came up to me and he said, Dr. Atkinson, I'd like to publish in the New England Journal of Medicine. Can you do that with me? And I was like, mm, well, we can try. And so maybe that's not the first place to start with research no. is like, I want to publish in one of the most prestigious journals I know. known to humankind. Let's work. Backwards. And you know what? I, I mean, I don't have, I, I'm, I have a couple of BMJs. That's as close as I've gotten to that, but I've certainly not had an, a New England Journal publication and probably never will. But the point is he was aiming high, and so we partnered up, and then, I mean, he moved on and is a family doctor in BC now, but meanwhile, the team kept going and got that. So I think that was, to me, is, you know, starting with a question from a medical student here in St. John leading to a multi-center international RCT is really sums it up for me is like, it can work. However, the, a very humble little paper that got published in Curious has made me think a lot. And that's, it's a series we're doing more. In fact, there's a couple of papers. It's a series that's more about social issues that we often overlook when we're doing our medicine. So here we are in emergency medicine, we're interested in saving lives and treating things that are urgent. Meanwhile, these are people who have lots of other things and can you help them in some other way? And so the two there were our exercise intervention. So simply taking a couple of minutes with somebody and saying, hey, you know what? Have you thought about exercise? <laughs> Which isn't always the easiest thing to bring up, but you know, we did a study in that where we prescribed it, we wrote it down do this. And then we followed up and we found that it actually improved people's exercise in a sustained manner, you know, at least three months later. So that was kind of cool because it makes you think, you know what, you have an opportunity with every patient to make their health and their life just a little bit better. The flip side of that was where we, where we don't do well. And that's on intimate partner violence screening and identifying women who are in danger. And, and really our research project in that showed that there's so much more we could do if we just, again, take that moment to think, this person's injured, let me just make sure they're safe. And so I think when you start to think about those societal impacts over and above just the clinical question, I think then you start to realize there's a whole different level that isn't about fancy statistics or complex research methods. It's just about the right thought and seeing if it's possible while you're doing your day-to-day -day job. So for me, those beat the, the paper in the big journal. And I think, you know, for me, if you, if you asked me what my favorite part about research 
was, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk in this podcast about how amazing it is to work with a research team. You know, we talk about interprofessional education and, uh, you know, multidisciplinary strategies in healthcare and really a research team is that at its best. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about so my social peds research team, you know, um, Sarah and Kate and Katie and, 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 you know, many of them doing other things and working on their own projects and then just us collaborating together. It's just such a beautiful mm-hmm. way to share ideas and share thoughts and, and to have different lenses, you know, like I think too, as, as faculty in medicine, we're, um, we see one piece of it, but then, you know, I have a social worker I work with for social peds and seeing her lens, having worked in child protection, all of a sudden makes you see a whole different way of things. So I really think that breaking down that, those sectors is such an amazing opportunity to in medicine, rather than just always looking at it from our, from our lens. So there's such an awesome opportunity there I agree. to collaborate with people. What you've done is very exciting. It really is. And what you're doing is very exciting. And you know, it reaches right out into society, into places that perhaps haven't felt any interest from the healthcare system for a long time. And so that's wonderful. And, um, and potentially impactful in the future, right? If, if, um, the stuff around, you know, protection of, of, of the unborn child during that, that, that key developmental phase by looking after their mother, you know, these are big, big deals. This is like major stuff for the future of our society and how we help people get out of poverty and how therefore we decrease the demand in the healthcare system moving forward. So it's wonderful stuff. And I'm really pleased that you're going to be part of our research council here at, at DMNB and as, as a, as a faculty of medicine person member and it's exciting to maybe join that up with some other people some of the the epidemiology folk and see what we can do with this type of stuff right i think it'll be awesome it's so true it's it's frustrating you know one of the questions i was going to ask you is what your frustrations are i know that my frustrations are a lot of my work actually turns out negative results which is why i'll never be famous from this um (laughs) because publications i guess that's again a shout out to open access type real-time journals is that it's nice to be able to publish things like how do I possibly measure what it means to not have a baby exposed to drugs or alcohol? Like, cause then you're trying to predict what could have been, which is very challenging. So. Oh, I don't know. Like there's a million challenges with research. And again, that that's, that's a whole other discussion about the frustrations of the day-to-day approach to research and the hours of work that it takes. And that's not to complain about it because nobody forces us into this. It's just that really, when you look at a paper at the end of the day, you know, you see a manuscript, it's published, or you see an abstract, it's a little bit deceptive to the amount of work that goes into getting to that point. And so, yeah, that's the other thing I would say for people. Yeah, you know, get involved for sure, but be prepared that it's it's not a quick thing. It's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of reading. It's a lot of thinking. But it's fun. But don't bite off more than you can chew. I think we've all been guilty of that. Of you know aiming too high in terms of the list of things we're going to try and achieve. So I do think, as with most things in medicine and life, you know, go slowly, build up a portfolio, build on that, and collaborate and, and share resources. So yeah, I, I honestly again. I'm not, I'm not going to be ashamed to say, please, for people, reach out, register with DMNB if you're interested in research, if you're doing some. We have to stick together in this in New Brunswick because it's a small group. It's a small province. There's not a lot of resources. Rather than competing with each other for whatever small resources are out there, I think let's find a few big questions that need to be answered that we can all work on together. That would be my goal. Whether or not that comes to fruition, time will tell. Well, you must have said that in your job interview because it certainly sounds very good to try to get us together as New Brunswick researchers. So no big surprise why um, you're leading this initiative now in Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick, and I'm so thankful for that. So Paul, thanks a million for coming on the podcast today. Research is near and dear to my heart. I'm um, so uh, hopeful that the faculty who listen to this podcast will be like, you know what? I've been meaning to answer that question. I'm going to shoot Paul an email or please shoot me an email. I could probably connect you with who you need to or go on the Dalhousie website, fill out your profile and become part of the family. 
You awesome. said it, the research family. There you go. Well, look, thank you so much, Sarah. And um, I don't know if you could hear my good friend, Charlie, the dog barking in the background and, and, and Kodo with her, but you know, there you go. They were trying to contribute their little part to this wonderful podcast. I really appreciate you reaching out. It's been fun. It's been, it's been great. And uh, congratulations to you on, on the series. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Fact Dev Lounge podcast. Please leave us a review on iTunes, YouTube, or SoundCloud, and even a comment on some ideas for future podcasts. Thank you very much and have a great day.